And Vicky High Spots back again. Been a minute, been a minute for anything here on the channel. Sorry for the mini hiatus, real life beckons, real life calls, but the hot, the summer has gotten hotter than ever, hotter than hell, because twice this year, once again, hell is frozen over. Three times, the third time, excuse me, this year, hell is frozen over. This time on Hibiki's High Spots, we're going all the way back to the year 1998, the prime, the golden age of WWF, the Attitude Era. But I figured if I'm going back to the most controversial era in WWE history, why not have my most controversial guest back one more time to round it all out? Once again, joining me in-house for this time, this review, SummerSlam 98, the infamous, the notorious, the most hated man in the IWC, DJ Storms. Welcome back. How you been? Where can everyone catch you? Uh, Mr. Habiki TMD, it has been a while, but you know, I guess I had to come back to the Habiki TMD channel to boost up the ratings. They were a little, sl they were slacking a little bit, kind of like Monday Night Raw has been slacking a bit. But you know, I'm hanging in there. I'm hanging in there. Thank you very much for having me back on the channel. I've been pretty good, a little under the weather, but um, I'm still hanging in there. Summer's been hot as hell some days. It's been raining some days. It's been uh, cool other days. Recently just put a pool up in my backyard, about to go swimming in it in a couple of hours after this. Uh, for all of you wondering where you can catch me, the greatest wrestling analyst on the planet, you can follow me on Twitter at HistoryMakerDJS. You'll find out why I am the operator of the best damn Twitter handle known to mankind. Follow me on Instagram as well, at TheDJStorms. Add me on Facebook, Dominic Sparacia, for collaborations and business inquiries. Please send me an email. My email is, of course, Storms takeover at gmail.com like the official dj storms business page and i made you send you an invite to join the official dj storms posse group on facebook subscribe to me on youtube it is dj storms like my videos comment down below of course you can catch the lightning flash update every single friday for the next couple weeks at least until the beginning of september i got some personal obligations to take care of on saturdays but as soon as i'm done with them lfu will be moving back to saturdays and of course a little a little um spoiler for what's to come in the next few weeks uh mr habiki tmd will be making a return to my domain on august 19th thursday yes. 2021 for the rundown for wwe SummerSlam 2021 we will be dissecting this piss poor card that wwe seems to be putting together i know you got a lot to say about uh nikki trash and uh oh. bill goldberg fighting mr lashley but uh that's another conversation for another time of course, when you hit the subscribe button, when you subscribe to me on YouTube, be sure to hit that notifications bell with a huge coup de grace. That way you will know whenever I pop up on YouTube because whenever I pop up on YouTube, it is the best time to be on YouTube. You can't see it, people, but let me tell you something. When you go on YouTube and you click one of those videos, you're going to see a glorious sideburn shin strap combination and a beautiful mustache like nobody else. I have the best facial hair in the IWC, very well-kempt and pristine. Bicky, why not? Why, or let's let's not waste any more time. Let's get straight into what was a uh, eh, a little bit of a lackluster pay per view. Really, a Monday Night Raw on steroids outside of the last two matches. Oh, exactly. Before we do, I just want to say I almost hung up on you when you compared me to Monday Night Raw. Just want to put that out there. <laughs> oh come on! You, you didn't think I was going to go that route? I'm DJ Storms, <laughs> and man. Is also, also <laughs> another question: Is your YouTube channel the best known wrestling channel known to Cactus Jack and Dude Love as well, or just Mankind? I had to. I had to. Too easy. Cactus, Cactus Jack, Dude Love, Mankind, The Undertaker, Stone Cold, anyone on the face of this planet, it is the best place to get your wrestling news, rumors, and reports, and all sorts of weekly show reviews for professional wrestling. There you go. And yes, I'm hyped to come back. Look for that soon over on DJ's channel. Guys, get over there, subscribe, all that good stuff. Follow him on Instagram, all that goodness. Yeah, we are, like you said, we're going 98. It's crazy how on this show we're about to talk about today, we've got gimmicks like Kurgan. Fucking, you know, you just got re the, the bottom barrel of Attitude Eric gimmicks. Some of them are on this show, yet somehow they're not as bad as Nikki Trash. It, it's amazing, right? I'd take Kurgan any day. I, I would gladly take the oddities. Yes. And let me tell you something. I, it wasn't, that wasn't even as bad as I thought 
it was going to be. I didn't pay attention, mm -hmm. but that wasn't as bad as I thought it was going to be. They, but they could have taken that match off the show and given a little bit more time to Mark Merrow and Jacqueline versus Sable and Edge. Props, to, uh, I'm, I know I'm skipping around a bit, but props to Merrow and Edge for, for making that a semi-decent wrestling match. Right, yeah, totally. I think the biggest glaring difference, and I kind of put a tweet out about it today, about this show, flash forward to this coming SummerSlam 2021, it's it just speaks to me where this was a time when the company trusted its roster members. They didn't outsource to part timers. They believed in what they had, and I think that's the biggest glaring difference and the biggest criminal offense flat out of modern WWE. They do not trust their talent for these big shows. Is that fair to say? It's not even like they don't trust their talent, dude. It's the fact that they refuse to bring talent up through the rankings to get on the level of a Randy Orton or an Edge or a Stone Cold or a Roman Reigns. Literally, there's only two individuals that are actually protected and feel quote-unquote important, and I use that term very loosely. Reigns is one of them, and then the other is Charlotte. But we all hate Charlotte because of how much she has been pushed to the forefront of the women's division while neglecting everybody else. It's that with Charlotte, it's that and I know we're talking modern grabs. Bear with us, guys. With Charlotte, it's it's that for me too, but especially in the last two years with Charlotte, she it just seems like she's phoning everything in. That that promo on Monday was abysmal. That was the most monotone, boring bullshit. The shit she had to use in that promo, I know everyone's panties are up in a bunch over the promo. Shut up. She's a heel. She's a fictional fucking character. She's supposed to say shit like that, okay? But no, let me tell you something. I was more I, I offended at woman. the delivery of that promo than I was the lines in the exactly. promo. Exactly. Exact. That's exactly what I said. I have look. I hate Charlotte, and rightfully so. I say it all the time on my channel. You, you'll catch me ranting on her on uh, on Friday on the LFU. But the 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 problem that I have is the fact that her delivery with these promos it's just so fucking atrocious who cares what she said in the promo you you should be mad that she's actually delivering promos that seem so overly forced and same thing with max caster i know we're talking about AEW now but you know the, the you 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 should have every right to be pissed that max caster and the acclaimed are not on dynamite more often i agree I agree. I think Max it's Caster it's is one of the most well-rounded, talented guys in the entire business. Legit Raptor, pretty decent in the ring. He's not hes not amazing, but he's also very young in the business. He's still developing. He's still developing in the ring, but he's decent for, for what he is right now. His main strength is going to be in the tag team. Anthony Bowens is clearly the better athlete than uh, Max Caster, but Max Caster, he is an absolute gem when it, when it comes to a live microphone. He, I, I'm probably the biggest Max Caster mark out there. I'm telling you, once him and Anthony Bowens, after they have a successful tag team title run, Max Caster, once he develops a little bit more in the ring, he is absolutely going to be a major player, at least a TNT champion. The best thing about Max Caster, too, I don't know if it's official, but you can tell, like, he kind of gives, like, the guys that he's going to cut promos on bullet points of where he's going, but he doesn't tell them everything. So, like, that one rap that he cut on Moxley about oral sessions from Renee, you can see that look on Moxley's face. Like, he didn't know that was coming, but that's... The beauty of it it's real and it's organic reactions just like just like um matt seidel that reaction with the, the quote rape line or whatever they did right on his face he was shocked julia hart shocked that's what's great about it and it just, if you don't like it i mean god what the fuck does everyone want for the past 10 years all i've heard is wrestling needs to be edgy again it needs to be the attitude era again you guys couldn't handle 10 minutes of the attitude era you really couldn't and if you're offended at that Max Caster promo, what Charlotte oh, yeah, I, said, I, go ahead and take your DX shirts, your Austin 316 merch, and throw that shit all in the trash. Because a lot of that shit would have never flown today. It's the same thing. Take all the rap albums you have with lyrics way worse than that and throw them in the trash. Take your beloved film franchises with movies like Django Unchained with slavery and Leonardo DiCaprio. Throw all that shit in the trash then. Because you obviously cannot handle anything except middle-of-the-road cookie-cutter bullshit. And it's tiresome. I'm sick of living in a world where we have goalposts moving constantly and everyone fucking crying. Why can we not have anything good anymore? It's just so frustrating. Get over yourselves and enjoy the rest. How many? How 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 much you want to bet that a good majority of the people that are complaining about what Charlotte and Max Caster said have 
Eminem soundtracks from the 90s. Exactly. Exactly. 100%. 100%. But I mean, like, do, do, let's, let's, I mean, come on, need we say more? Exactly. But let's cut the shit with the modern talk, because that's not why we're here. We're here to go retro. The summer of 1998, DJ Storms. I was 14 years old, and this was the most amazing time to be a fan for me personally. Everything was popping. WCW, ECW, WWE, everything was firing in all cylinders. WCW was kind of dwindling down. It's becoming watered down, the same old NWO shit. But my God, WWF at this time, a lot of people hate Vince Russo. I don't hate Vince Russo. I think he had a lot of good ideas. And a lot of that is very prevalent in long-term storytelling that you see on the show. Seeds planted. Yeah, there was a match on here that sucked. But in long-term, where they were going, it made sense story-wise. We'll get there. I, I, I can't explain to you guys who didn't experience this at the time how great this was and just the the storytelling with taker and austin the amazing video build-up package for this using acdc's highway to hell with those two was incredible it still holds up go back check it out you said this is a raw on steroids i gotta agree i gotta agree wwf yes they were hitting their stride in the attitude era but they didn't have all the pieces aligned yet the hardys were barely on tv edge was just getting on tv The staples of the Attitude Era were kind of finding their way in. Rock was almost there, not quite, but you could definitely see where Rock was white hot. This crowd did not want to boo the Rock at the end of the day, but, you know, it worked. Let's let's get right to it. Um, This match, Madison Square Garden, the first time WWE went back to MSG since the very first SummerSlam in 1988. This was a huge deal, a huge deal at the time. And one thing I miss about MSG shows and the WWE DJ is how they used to shoot this with the hard cam. With the entrance as the focal point. They did this in like a Raw in 09. I think that's the last time they did this in MSG with that kind of setup. But I liked it because it was different. I didn't I didn't mind it whatsoever. Um the uh the uh the difference in um putting an entrance ramp in front of the ring or on the side of the ring. Little little details like that give give the show a uh sense of a sense of revitalization if i may and it's really something that wwe should actually try now um they should try switching things up a little bit um really 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 cut down on the over polishment of raw and and smackdown it it really just looks like a fucking broadway play and it would be much much better if they'd actually get down to the nitty-gritty make it a little bit more edgy in appearance you don't need to you don't need to go all the way back to 1988 and make shit makes it feel like oh the attitude era is back in 2021 no but at least make your presentation look a little bit more intense make it a little bit more visually appealing like there's so much bright lights it looks like a hollywood movie i think my favorite set they've ever done to this day is that old backlash set with like the two axes swinging the entire at the entrance that was amazing um, that was actually a very good set. What what backlash was that? I think two thousand. I want to say ninety nine or two thousand. One of them. I'm gonna have to go back and watch that. Uh, my my favorite set's actually the WrestleMania twenty nine set in which I was there. Oh, uh, the, the Brooklyn, Brooklyn Bridge, Bridge, Empire yeah. State Building. Yeah, Empire yeah. State Building. Great I, great I, shit right there. Shitty WrestleMania, but I did love the uh, theme park set too. I thought it was, was not. Cool. It was not necessarily shitty. No, I mean the theme it park was... mania was shitty. Is what I'm saying. That was a shitty mania, but I love the roller coaster setup for thirty two. Oh yeah 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 that that yeah that mania was shit. That mania was not good. Twenty nine was eh. It was eh. Yeah. This show kicked off with a long forgotten WWF title. The European title was on the line. D'Lo Brown. With his, his chest protector and all, which will come into play in this match, going against the porn star himself, Mr. Penis Man, Val Venus. Um, uh, this match... You just call him Mr. Penis Man. I don't know why I said that. Welcome to Hibiki TMD. Well, Mr. Penis Man. So you, so you got Mr. Penis Man, then you got Billy Gunn and Mr. Ass. There you go. I... One of my well, what's favorite... Sable? What's, what's Sable? What, what's Sable? Uh, you know, say Sable's uh, Miss, uh, Miss Tata's? There you go. Mrs. Tits. There you go. There you go. One of my favorite unsung heroes of the entire Attitude Era was D'Lo Brown. I thought I think he was an incredible performer. I think he was ahead of his time. I think his in-ring style, not in this match, but like a year from now, when he'd be doing that co-IC and European title gimmick and stuff like that, he was putting out some solid matches, and I just love the whole head bobble and 
D'Lo was great, man. And Val, Val was all right. You know, I remember at this time being a teenager and seeing rumors that Val Venus was going to join DX. And, and I could kind of see that, but 2020, that wouldn't have worked. I don't feel like. Let me tell you something. Uh, this match, actually, was probably the third best match of the night. And I would have ranked it a little bit higher. I probably would have been saying that this match was overall very good if it didn't end in a disqualification. I don't know what is it what it is with you, man, but why are you always picking pay-per-views in which they have disqualification finishes or uh, non-finishes in title matches? Is it, is it because you know it pisses me off? No, it's because this was just a sign of the times. That was their easy out on a lot of these. They... They do that shit now on pay per view, like we saw with Rhea and Charlotte, and 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 by all means, that was a terrible. That's one of the worst finishes I've ever seen with the little the table lid, and that's why she got DQ'd because she's the table. And then lid. and then Charlotte kicked the steps into Rhea's leg, but she didn't get DQ'd. Exactly, and and, and people people revolted. With all you know, and that's justified. Here, the MSG crowd was pissed. This finish, this finish was terrible. It was awful. Um. A I fucking ch what a fucking chest protector, and then the ref gets thrown. It's so stupid. And they were putting on a very good match. They were like they were. for for my for for my standards, I was not expecting this match to be that good because a lot of the matches from an in ring standpoint throughout the Attitude Era, outside of the main guys, a lot of the matches throughout the Attitude Era were not very good but this match from an in-ring perspective these two knew how to work these two were putting on a very good match and then the finish came there was a there i don't know if you call this spot in the match and it's kind of eerie considering what happened a year later with d'lo and draws um d'lo brown went for a power bomb on val venus in this match and i think it was perspiration or something but his first attempt i don't know if you call it this he dropped val right on his head it was like val slipped he couldn't quite get him up and like you could hear the oh from the crowd it looked Val's lucky. I'm just going to say that in this night. But then uh, D'Lo went for it again and got the... I love that running powerbomb. I think that was always a great move at D'Lo's. But uh, the finish in this match, for anyone that's never seen it, obviously D'Lo Brown's doing the chest protector gimmick because Dan Severn ripped off his his pectoral muscle and in kayfabe. So D'Lo's using the, the chest protector, which is reinforced and would help him eventually win the European title. And, it, you know, heel tactics, using it to cheat. His finisher, the frog splash, obviously, blah, blah, blah. Val's finisher was also a top rope splash. So the finish came when Val took the chest protector off D'Lo, put it on himself, went to the top rope. The referee, the fucking idiot referee, goes to stop Val, accidentally crotches Val on the top rope. The crowd booed the shit out of the ref. Then D'Lo and Val went to fight for the chest protector like two schoolgirls. Unintentionally, intentionally, I don't know, knocking the ref. Val pushing the ref, getting the DQ. And that was the finish and still your champ. D'Lo Brown, awful finish. Good little match. I totally agree. Ugh, oh, dude. And then and then, then the ref caught the money shot afterwards. Yeah, that I feel like this entire match was just made for that spot. You know? Why? I mean, if you, if you want, if you wanted to do a money shot on Jimmy Corderas, just trot him out there, have Val Venus super kick him, and then do the money shot. Seriously, N enough, enough with the DQ finishes. It, it's it's one of the most overused concept in the WWE right now. Disqualification finishes. I absolutely hate it. And a lot of people. Yeah, say I wish I wish that we could go one year, a full year, without a single DQ finish in a single match, no matter on what show. I also think it's one of the most untalked about nails in the coffin for WCW too. People like to say, you know, the Attitude Era killed WCW, the Finger Poker Doom. Go back. Almost every main event of Nitro in like '98 was a DQ finish, and I think fans just got tired of that shit. You always knew the NWO was going to interfere. It was a pointless fucking main event every fucking week, man. Even on paper, WCW was just pumping it out. But you think WWE is bad now? WCW doing the non finishes was like just a machine gun, just da 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 da, -da nonstop. <laughs> it was terrible. Machine gun, more like a mini gun. Yeah. Um. But, um, um, but you know. <sighs> Mo moving on to uh, yeah, the match that you uh, you were wishing me luck on. <laughs> I had a, I High end tie. The only reason this match was put on pay-per-view was because ICP was in the corner of the oddities. That's the entire reason this match was here, because ICP was, quote, not even close to mainstream, but they were, they were somewhat, you know, B-list, C-list celebrities. And at the time, WWE was still a privately owned company. They were taking any celebrities they could get. You know, flat out. 
They're still taking celebrities now. They had Bad Bunny at fucking WrestleMania. Well, Bad Bunny's more of a mainstream, but back then, I mean, even at this year's Mania, you had Jennifer Flowers and the Bill Clinton scandal. You had, you know, ICP. They were just taking anybody they could, you know. They had Akira Tozawa's father, Funaki, on the uh, opposing team. It's a shame how wasted Akira Tozawa is. And some things the never guy's change. guy's such a great worker, my God. Well, it's crazy how some things, as much as they change, some things stay exactly the same. Because you got Kai and Tai, which is basically the core of Michinoku Pro Wrestling in Japan. Dick Togo, Sho Funaki, um, uh, uh, Terry Boy, and Taka Michinoku, four amazing performers, who a year before this appeared at ECW's first pay-per-view, Barely Legal, and, and the best match on the entire fucking show in an incredible six-man match relegated to this you know just the stereotypical you know asian gimmick blah, 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 going against a collective of some of the worst workers i have ever seen <laughs> in my entire life except for earthquake i love earthquake who is golga under the mask the oddities with icp kurgan giant sylvia luna vachon and icp comedy match Comedy match, flat out, but not as bad as it should have been, I feel like. Like you said earlier, this wasn't dog shit, right? So it wasn't as bad as it should have been, but in no way, shape, or form should this have been on SummerSlam. This should have been taken off of SummerSlam, and they should have absolutely given more time to uh, Ken Shamrock and Owen Hart. They could have given more time to the mixed tag team match. They could have given a little bit more time to Double J and X-Pac in the hair versus hair match. The opening match. And... What'd you say? They, more time to the opening match that we just talked about. And, well, no, no, the opening match was fine. That went about 15 minutes. That was the perfect length of time. If they would have changed the finish of the opening match to a clean finish, then it would have been fine. The opening match went the perfect amount of time. Nice, solid 15 minutes with a terrible ending, of course, in which Jimmy Corderas was the idiot of the night. I know that the oddities are wrestle crap, and that's in like the Hall of Fame of wrestle crap gimmicks. And yeah, they're a meme, and they're but there is no denying that the oddities, love them or hate them, were over. They were over in this. The fans oh no, they they were absolutely over. Okay, here here's a question though: oddities or Dungeon of Doom? Oddities. Okay, okay, fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> How dare you disrespect the shark attack? I mean, he look at that Renaissance man. He was in both stables. Unbelievable. Earthquake, the shark. Um, he was Golga. Was it Golga? Yeah. Unreal. Look at that. Rest in peace, John Tenta. But no, this match had all the comedy spots you would imagine. Everybody in the oddities was a fucking giant, so of course they played to that the entire match, as they should have. I didn't want to see Taka out there power bombing Kurgan. It would have made no fucking sense. Um, but just such a waste of the talent. Well, it would have been entertaining. It would have been entertaining. It would have. But again, like Taka was such an incredible, still is. The guy never ages. The guy's still going today, you know. Is he? He's in. He's in a. a, a I have Minoru no idea. Suzuki's stable. He's been a fixture in that for like the past couple years. Suzuki guy. Really? Mm -hmm. Never ages. Unbelievable. Yeah. Unreal. What What do you grade this match? I'm curious. Uh, uh, how How do you want me to grade? Are you talking about like on a scale from one to ten, a, a, a to F? Just a dud in general, not worthy. Um, of like on a on a scale from uh, on a scale from zero to five stars, I'd probably give it a uh, one, which is bet which is better than what I was going to give it initially before I saw the match. I was going to give it a zero. Yeah, yeah, I, I've seen worse. I have actually seen worse than this match. So I watched Nia Jax. Uh, I, I take this week. match over the Punjabi Prison match with uh, Mahal and Orton oh. at Battleground. Which, by the way, I was there live in attendance for. I'm so sorry. Could you... I didn't think it was going to be that bad, but I had more fun eating a 14-inch slice of Philadelphia pizza than I did watching that match. I would take this match over every match Nia Jax has ever had. Is that fair to say? I was, dude, how is it that she's been on the roster for six years and she's gotten worse? So how? I say it all the time. It's, it's it's actually quite remarkable at how good she is at getting worse every year. It's kind of a talent, right? I I I, I, I don't know what to say, dude. I, I, I'm trying to figure it out. Well, I know what I to say. It just goes it to show me, depending on certain talent and who you're related to and how the company feels about you, you don't got to train. You don't got to fucking work out, obviously, because let's you know let's cut the shit. She's not. <laughs> it's so yeah, she's a. Uh... Nia Flapjacks with two pounds of butter and two bottles of maple syrup. 
With me, it's the ego on the woman. It always has been. Every bo- every continuous bot she's ever made, she's never come out and felt sorry about it. She, In her mind, she's playing her heel character, and she's just been arrogant about every injury. No, that's not a heel character. It's not. That's just you being shit at your job. It's not, Same it's, thing with Eva Marie. Eva Marie is trying so hard to troll people lately, but it's so sad and see-through. Like she, it's, it's not good on Twitter. She is terrible. Dude, I'm telling you right now, if Alexa Bliss ends up making Eva Marie disappear, I will never say another negative thing about Alexa Bliss ever again. Where did that take us to next on SummerSlam 98? Uh, Double J versus X-Pac. This was a hair versus hair match. Decent match. Decent little wrestling match. And X-Pac wins clean. Double J got his head shaved, quote unquote shaved. It wasn't really shaved. It was just it was just clipped a little bit. And then he became the uh the asshole double J with the short hair. And uh I, that that was actually my favorite version of uh Jeff Jarrett when he was hitting uh, fabulous Moolah over the head with a guitar and putting May Young in the figure four. That was great. Well it's great like television. Jeff Jarrett cut his hair, got that gimmick, and had that gimmick till this day, till he retired for twenty years. It was the same thing. The don't piss me off, the chosen one. It was it was the same gimmick in WCW. And that's not to say that's a bad thing. It worked for him, you know? I, that, that was his best version. I mean, like, he, he, was, a, he was a decent heel. Like, like here's the thing. It, in terms of... I think his wrestling ability got better over time. But his character during, like, the golden era before, like, he, he got his head shaved and he became a little bit more serious. And, like, you know, he was with Ro- the Road Dog and all that. That was that was a it was a very good cocky southern heel character. But, the but I, lo- I I loved <laughs> but I, I loved I loved the more I loved the version after that. I just thank God they tweaked his outfit finally because he looked like a bad gay stripper or something with that old outfit. Oh my God, his his ring attire was terrible. <laughs> if he would have just wrestled in the tights without a shirt, that would have been just fine. Lest we forget like, the, the true nice. star of this match, DJ Howard Finkel. Howard Finkel, the Fink. Who early, and this was also the time, too, where Sunday Night Heat had just debuted. It was a brand new show, but they would they would always have Sunday Night Heat live on the weeks of the pay-per-view, so they would film in the same arena. So essentially, fans got two or three more bonus matches. But on Sunday Night Heat before this match, uh, Double J and Southern Justice, the Godwins, his little Alabama stable, whatever it's called, <laughs> they shaved Howard Finkel's head. And, and, and poor Howard Finkel, he should have never rocked a bald book because there were dents, there were divots. There were valleys. There were hills. It's just poor Howard Finkel. But they uh, were dense. They were divots. They were valleys. I, 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 I don't, I don't know what to say to that. I think I'm, I think I'm tapped out for the, for the rest of the podcast. <laughs> it was so weird to see Howard Finkel do a suck it too. Like what an awkward suck it that was. I mean, hey, people love to think. Fine match though. Nothing nothing to complain about in the match. I feel like the crowd was a little down for the match, but it also felt like when X Pac came out for his entrance, it was the first time we got like a real star on this card and the fans reacted to that. You could tell that finally we got like a you know You know, you know why? It was because of the shitty finish in the opening match and it was because of uh oddities and kai and tai. Oddities right. may have been over, but they were not good in the ring. They were not they were not the type of people that were gonna give you great wrestling matches they they were they were all gimmick no no in ring work i think that oddities match clocked in at like eight minutes you could have cut that in half to be honest. no 10 minutes 10 minutes i actually looked it up okay you totally could have there's no reason you couldn't have cut that in half uh we could have cut that off the show completely we could have yeah but if you if you got to do it cut it cut it in half put it on monday night raw seriously just put it on raw Save the save the pay per view for your major stars that will give you the match of the year candidates worthy of being on a SummerSlam card. Yeah, this uh, I think Sean Waltman X Pac is always criminally overlooked as one of the best performers of this era. His match with uh, Bret Hart on Monday Night Raw '94 is still one of my top five Monday Night Raw matches to this day in history. I think he. Was- I met him actually at a G- at a JCW event at the end of 2014. I got a signed picture by him. Very, 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 very nice guy. And he was actually still wrestling at that time. Uh, he, he's he's a very good performer. He's always been a very, very solid performer. He's always been a very passionate performer. So when it comes to in-ring work, I think, uh, I think uh, you know, he, he's, he definitely deserves a lot more credit than he's been given. 
It's really odd to me, man, that they never at least once gave him an IC title run. When you would see guys like Test and Albert and all these ridiculous guys, Ezekiel Jackson, hold the Intercontinental title yet. I feel like X-Pac could have been a shoe in to try to hold that belt, the workhorse title, but they never did that, you know? I, w- I, wish, I wish they would have. I, re- I really wish they would have pushed him to, like... Was he European champion or no? Yeah, he was. He had a match with Shane McMahon at the next year's Mania for the European title. He should have been Intercontinental champion at least once. He was a very, he was a solid Intercontinental champion. He he really could have he really could have made made that title feel prestigious if they develop developed a little bit more credibility for him. I feel as though he was kind of putting a lot of comedy matches, but at the same point in time, he he like he could work because like, again, hair versus hair match, it is kind of a comedy match. And 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 when there's a hair versus hair match, you already know that the baby face is winning that match. Every exactly. I don't. I don't think. I don't think the uh, the heel has ever won a hair versus hair match. Because what's the point? You know, <laughs> if if the if the beloved baby face is going to get his head shaved, then that like two minutes or three minutes of them shaving his head, the crowd's going to be bored out of their mind, or they're going to hijack. Because that's not what they want to see. You know. I mean, like they're they going to hijack worse than they hijacked Raw this past Monday. Ooh, good lord. Um, let's just take us to the backstage Mick Foley interview with Vincent Mann. I'm pretty sure. Um, I actually thought that um, you, you, you we were actually talking about this before we uh, started to record this. This was like the beginning stages, and uh, as well as the match, it was the beginning stages of Babyface Mankind. Right. Who was who was trying to be a glisten in Vince, Vincent Mann's eyes, kayfabe wise. He was trying to impress Uncle Vince, so he would. He would do anything, and you can see the brainwashing in the angle where Vince talked him into going out there because his tag team champions were Mick Foley and Kane, who had just beaten uh, the New Age Outlaws for the titles, and they were trying to get their, their rematch and all that. Kane no-showed. Nobody knew where the fuck Kane was. So Vincent Mann was trying to brainwash Mick and to go out there, and he goes, think about it. You beat the champs alone in Madison Square Garden. You'll be a legend. And it worked. It talked the character of Mankind into going out there, essentially on a suicide mission because that's what we got. He got destroyed. But th- was like this said, before or after Mr. Sako? When did Mr. Sako come around? Sako came in a month later, actually. Um, the end of September. Oh, my God. I, I knew it was sometime in 1998, I know. And then that became the most over thing. That, that, was, that was the start of everything. A fucking sock. And that's the thing about Mick Foley. Even though he was a heel in here, you wouldn't know it because nobody wanted to boo Mick Foley. He was so lovable. They had already told his life story on TV. How could you boo this guy? You know what I mean? And it worked. It, it worked. After, too, too, too much earlier, he almost died in that Hell in a Cell match. Exactly. And it's baffling, too, because it's over. We'll get there with the match later. But as over as the Outlaws were, why would you put them in there with a guy the fans don't want to boo? And the crowd, I feel like, kind of felt sympathy for Mick in that match later. And we're in the corner of Mick. And we're booing the Outlaws, the, one of the most over acts in the company. <laughs> It's, it's it's very very odd to to this day like I don't know like why they put certain people in there with uh certain people that they know they're not going to get booed or they're not they're not going to get cheered and they 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 know that it's going to be a lose lose situation. We see it like, now. Like, what they, like, yeah, like, like exactly. I was I was just going to say the same exact thing two weeks in a row. Keith Lee gets gets the win, but before Karrion Cross got the win, so who the fuck gets over? And I would say that now, currently with Keith Lee and Karrion Cross, is about ten times more of a bonehead fucking decision than anything they booked back then because. My, you don't even got to say why. One guy is an up-and-coming star, the other's your NXT champion, and we're just trading fucking wins, and now nobody cares, because what's the point? And after what happened, you surprised that Adam Cole's rejected the last couple of um, major contract offers from WWE? Not at all. And are, are you surprised that nobody gives a fuck about the NXT TakeOver main event now? Because I don't. I don't give a shit about them. Even though nobody they gives had a shit about a... NXT. Dude, no, dude, dude. Nobody gives a shit about NXT. Why should Karrion they? Cross the company doesn't the give a shit about NXT. Of hope. Exactly. Cross was the last beacon of hope. He was the final nail in the coffin. If Karrion Cross, a guy that checks off all the boxes and has all the credentials of a Vince McMahon guy, muscles in his arms, muscles in his legs, muscles in his fucking earlobes, and he can't even succeed, what makes you think anyone else is going to succeed? The company's never going to get better until the old man's gone. How do you, and uh, most, you know, glaringly, first and foremost, how do, and we're going to talk about this on your show coming up. We'll get a little sneak peek. How do you fuck up The Fiend? How on earth do you fuck up The Fiend? My Dude, how do you fuck, dude, 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 it's not even The Fiend. 
how do you fuck up Bray Wyatt in general? Yeah, that first like, like, and, money dude, I got a lot to say on Bray Wyatt come my show. Yeah, there you go. Talk, speak, I, I, speak. I, I don't even I don't even know where to begin. Let, let, and let, let me tell you something. So I'm sorry to interrupt no, you. I'm no, sorry to no. stay on this topic. But um dude, there's no reason, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna say this again on my show. There's no reason why Bray Wyatt shouldn't have been at the level that Roman Reigns is at right now six years ago when he was the eater of worlds there's no reason they made him the eater of pens that's what they did exactly dude in 2014 there were crowds swaying their hands back and forth with bray wyatt singing he's got the whole world in his hands how do you let that slip it's through the, your fingertips you let that slip through your fingertips because he, he met a jorts wearing brick wall named john cena which derailed the entire fucking thing you know? And that's not even Cena's fault. That was Vince's fault. Yep. Because Cena was always putting people over at that time. Cena learned his lesson from his his backstage power when he fucked up the Nexus. And and Cena. Oh my up, yeah 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 that, yeah that was. Uh... Cena has always owned up to that. He was like, you know, it was a wrong call on my part. Blah blah. So you can tell Cena has spent his time trying to build and you know groom the next era. He really has. But then the old man comes and in and fucks it up every time. You know, look what he did for Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens on Raw and stuff. It's not a John Cena problem. You're absolutely right. It's the old man in the tower. And the sooner he after retires, after the uh, Nexus issue, after the Nexus issue, it was never a John Cena problem because he started putting over a lot of people. He started putting over CM Punk. Started putting over uh, guys like Owens. Started putting over guys like Styles. Started putting over a lot of people. Speaking of over, speaking of getting over on as little as possible, Sable. My God, was this woman on fire in 98. And if you go back and you watch, and I've done this time and time again, I still don't know why. She was terrible on the mic. Shit in the ring. Not a wrestler. Just a cookie-cutter, stereotypical blonde. But I think what made Sable stand out like that, just like with Sunny, why people went so ape shit, she was one of the first. It was this first wave of this TNA. You, not, you never saw WWE focus on sex before this, ever. But I think exactly you could if it had been Tori Wilson first in this position, Stacy Keebler, any of them. It was I think with Sable, it was right place, right time, right time. Sense. There you go. That's exactly. But well, well it, it it comes it comes down to that. Ultimately, when it when it comes to the WWE, it never comes down to talent. It never comes down to uh, promo skills or in ring work. It doesn't come down to the proper booking. It just comes down to right place, right time. Exactly. Mixed tag match. We had already seen one at WrestleMania 14 this year, but once again, the tables have flipped, by the way. Mark Merrow on the opposing side with his valet, Jacqueline, a Hall of Famer, going against Sable and a mystery partner. And you ask, who could that mystery partner be? Who could the talent be that would be kind of just like Sable's character, who you could see, you know, oh, that makes sense to pair them together. Edge, the guy who has no friends, the vigilante. That made that made no sense for him to be a partner as Sable. But here we are. I feel I feel like what they wanted to do was kind of get a new guy on the card and showcase him yeah. in a prime spot on pay-per-view. And even though it didn't make sense, Edge and Mark Merrow, they actually worked fairly well together as... As a, as a duo, because Jacqueline and Sable, my God, were they terrible. Edge and Mark Merrow, they actually knew how to wrestle, and they actually gave us a semi-entertaining wrestling match. So at the end of the day, I don't really mind it, because it, re it, it was kind of the jump start to Edge really getting in front of a major stage, and it was the jump start to Edge really really morphing into his own, because he, he was always a good wrestler. This was kind of the start of him the start of him really becoming familiar with the audience. Edge's pay-per-view debut, by the way. And, and there you go. Exactly. Exactly. Edge's pay-per-view debut. And you could totally uh, he, tell he, uh, he ended certain, up You could totally tell the creative, just the working genius of Edge, like the spot with Sable where she rolled up and like they did that for the finish. You could tell that was Edge's idea. You could tell that he was the architect to a lot of stuff in this match. Mark, credit to Mark Marrow, too. Mark Marrow is always an underrated worker, I feel like. Really oh, no, he's absolutely underrated. He's always been underrated. Mark Merrow, he's very, very good. He doesn't really get enough praise because he didn't really do much in his career outside of his feud with Sable. Well, that's because he had Sable. I feel like had he Sable, Sable it's kind of like what we're going through with Cross now, right? He's like the new Mark Merrow. You take away Sable from Merrow, what they did, and you're left with the bloom was off the rose, and he had he, he became this awful boxer gimmick, and then it was all downhill from here, and nobody gave a fuck about Mark Merrow. It's, it's not even about that. It, it all it all comes down to the booking. 
Cross would be just fine without Scarlet, but the problem is, is that they just put him on Raw and he already has two losses underneath his belt. But you know, when it when it comes to when it comes to that, that that's a different story for a different time. Mark Marrow, they didn't they didn't really capitalize on what they had. He could have been a solid mid card champion. Yeah. Well, he was former IC champion, but I think he held that for like a month a year earlier. Got in exactly. Yeah, it was, it was on like it was on like a month. Yeah. It was very very forgettable. If you would have told me back then, fourteen year old me watching this, that 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 one guy in this match would go on to be like a eleven time champion, Hall of Famer, I would have called you a liar. But you could definitely see the star quality of a young edge in this match. He jumped off the screen. He really did. He he was a very good pro wrestler. When when it comes to Edge, um, Edge was pro- probably one of the best well rounded superstars of all time. Edge, the guy, yeah, sorry. Sarman. Every character that um that he played, he, he was he was just perfect. He had a great look. He was an overall fantastic professional wrestler. And when you and, and when you have a guy like that, and he didn't come from anything, the guy didn't come from anything. He was not born into this business. He didn't have a famous last name. He wasn't buddy buddy with anyone. He didn't really have the yeah yeah. It was just a fan. And he came into the WWE, and he just hit it out of the park in every single area. Edge has never been the guy in the company. So maybe the past year or so, you could say Edge is one of the guys. But for, I'll take Edge on my roster any day. Any day of the week. How could you not want Edge on your roster? Never a top guy, but always in the conversation, I feel like, you know? I love this feud with The Undertaker in 2008. This this match was what it was. I mean, there's... You already knew who was going to win. I mean, why Why would Mark Merrow win this match? It would be terrible, but... That's what we got, Edge and Edge and uh, Sable Victorious. I think next we're going to the amphitheater next door at MSG, right? Yes, uh, this was the uh, Lions. Yeah. Oh wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait. Are you are you talking about the next match? Yes. Oh, oh, you are, you are. Okay. So yeah, Ken Shamrock and Owen Hart. This was the Lions Den match. Another decent little match, but I feel as though it could have gotten a little bit more time to. Uh, Really tell a bit more of a story if you would have taken out Kai and Ty versus the fucking oddities. Yeah. This this was a feud, Owen Hart and Ken Shamrock, that I feel like I, I don't know why it happened, but I'm glad it did. Because before a month earlier before this had fully loaded, they had a match in the in the actual Hart dungeon at Stu Hart's house. And it wasn't amazing, but it was clever and how they were. It was just it was different. And and I liked it. Um let, let's cut the shit about Ken Shamrock and, dare I say, Dan Severn. Another thing about timing, had Steve Austin not have been around at this time, I feel like Ken Shamrock would have been their top guy. Fair to say? Really? I just, I feel like, so it's just always a bridesmaid, never a bride with Shamrock. He, There's no way he was ever going to reach the popularity of Steve Austin. But had Steve Austin not been there, there's no reason I feel like Ken Shamrock, they wouldn't have taken a chance with the, the WWF title on him at least once. I don't know. I, I never really looked at Ken Shamrock as as a uh, a world champion. Like I feel as though Ken Shamrock, he was merely more of a uh, he was more of a promo than a pro wrestler. I, I don't know why. I just kind of found them a little bit boring in the ring. I guess just that's just because of his technical style. He was kind of like Zack Saber Jr. before or, or Timothy Thatcher before they, they they came to be in the world of pro wrestling. Right. Uh, like you said, this match you could have got more time. It was just, it was, it was once again something brand new. It, it's kind of hard to shit on the first ever something in the company. So you know they never really tried this worked MMA style match before. It was fine. I did, I didn't hate this. It did, it did drag a little bit. It, it, it was, it was decent because Owen Hart's Owen Hart. I mean, oh, exactly. he's Owen fucking yeah. He's Owen fucking Hart. I mean, how how can anything be bad when you got Owen Hart in a fucking in a fucking match? Shamrock would get the win in this match, uh, clean, obviously, with, uh, oh, excuse me, Dan Severn throwing in the towel, actually. <laughs> um, it's crazy a month later they would turn Shamrock heel because of the reaction he got for winning. The crowd loved it, you know, in the amphitheater next door. But the Shamrock thing, I think fans were just tired of it. It was the same promos. He was kind of stale personality-wise. It, it was just... Oh, no, like, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you got, absolutely. When you got a guy coming out there on the same card like the fucking Rock... Who is just the epitome of the charisma? Fans just and Stone Cold Steve Austin. 
And, and uh, yeah, and a month later at Breakdown 98, when they had the triple threat match, The Rock versus Mankind versus Shamrock in the cage for the number one contendership, people shit all over Shamrock in that match. And he was a babyface. And and then they eventually he joined the, joined the corporation and they turned him heel. They actually listened to the fans. What a concept. Well, uh, welcome to the Attitude Era. Yeah. At, at that rate, I don't, I don't even think. Here's here's the thing. I don't even think they wanted to. They they did it because they had to, because it was the attitude era. They needed to be WCW. Yep. Up next, not much of a match at all. But it goes back to what we were talking about earlier: the tag team title match. The New Age Outlaws looking to reclaim the gold against Mankind uh, by himself. This was just a fucking beatdown. There's there was no offense. Yeah, five from five, five five minutes. New champions. Yep. Uh, exactly. Dumpster at ringside, uh, a little baby table spot in the corner. That was a weird table spot, especially for your second biggest show of the year. Nothing spectacular at all about this match. This match was just all storyline, like I said, all leading up to the Outlaws winning clean, throwing Mankind in the dumpster, all for Kane to pop out, and we're supposed to think that he hit Mankind's face with a sledgehammer. Not good. Not good. And then we got Mr. Sacco in a month, and uh, that became the most over thing on the show. Less said about this match, the better, unless you want to add anything. Um, new tag team champions of the world. Road Dog Jesse James, the badass Billy Gunn, the New Age Outlaws, and uh, that was pretty much it. Fair to say, still the most over tag team the company's ever had to this day. New Age Outlaws? I don't know. I think you can make a case for either the Dudleys or the Hardys, bro. That is true. That is true. I, th I do especially, miss especially, especially with the Devon get the tables. One thing I do miss in wrestling are the sing-along promos. I know we get that some... Well, they're not even together anymore, but SCU and Enzo and Cass were kind of the last ones to do that. With like, this is the worst town, you know? I've ever been in... Yep, yeah. I, th I, I, I Dude, I don't know how they fucked up Enzo and Cass. That dude, they, they, had, they were fucking money. And I mean money. Should have been tag team champions. I think it's more of a case where Enzo and Cass fucked up Enzo and Cass on their backstage... Uh, just demeanor, fair to say. <laughs> well, look, everyone has has issues like that. Um, you know, going through the rankings and going through the rankings and uh, you know, growing up in the business and all that. But at the end of the fucking day, when you have money like that, no matter what, you capitalize on it, and then you work with them along the way on their backstage behavior. Up next, a lot of people don't like the slatter match. I disagree. I like this ladder match because it was a totally different kind of ladder match as we see 90% of ladder matches are. There wasn't a bunch of high flippy spots. There wasn't a bunch of crash suicide spots. This was just a methodical, I'm going to beat the shit out of you, grounded ladder match. And I, I, I kind of, it was refreshing. Um, did people didn't like this match? I've, uh, Let me tell you something. For years, I, I, I've seen people shit on this match. I am very, very, very ingrained in the modern style of pro wrestling, but this was the match of the night for me. This was this was excellent. I thought they told a very nice story throughout this match. The only thing that I hated was the fact that China came in and low blowed the rock, and then Mark Henry stood out there like a fucking idiot while Triple H was climbing the ladder, tapping on the ring. Hey, Rock! Hey, Rock! You gotta get out! Triple H is class. Like, that's the only part that I hated about the match. Other than that, it was an excellent story. God bless year two rookie Mark Henry and his lack of ring awareness. <laughs> Dude, I mean, I mean, come on. It was just, it was so obvious. Like, I saw him throughout the corner of my eye at the bottom of the screen. Just get in the ring if China did it. There's no rule of how many times you can interfere. You already interfered once. There you are can no interfere rules. a second. It's no DQ. Yeah, exactly. For those unaware, we're talking about Intercontinental's had a ladder match, Triple H going against The Rock. I would say the first prominent booking on a card for either of these guys in, in a in a quote top role. Fair to say? Uh yeah, I would say that uh this was really the launching pad for these two. Coming out for um for both. Yes, absolutely, absolutely. Um, the Rock, we all know how good he was with his uh, promo skills, but uh, this match I feel as though opened a lot of eyes. And then uh, Triple H with uh, with how he has uh, been booked early on and how he was kind of always in the shadow of Shawn Michaels, but now Shawn retired earlier in the year because of a back injury. And now Triple H 
he's uh he gets to uh take the major spotlight and this was a uh a major match to do so he ended up winning which was the right call because the rock he was already over as a heel he didn't really need the intercontinental title and he was definitely going to go on to achieve bigger and better things he would actually win the world title later on i believe right Yes, Survivor Series, and then the corporate. Yes, champion. Survivor Series, and yes, and yes, he would become the uh, corporate champion, which would then lead to Austin and Rock won at WrestleMania 15, and uh, that was uh, that was uh, pretty much it. You now the rest is history for the Rock, but uh, yeah, these two told a very excellent story. Um, the blood definitely added a lot to it. Um, when it comes to ladder matches, obviously. This was not the era where we were going to see a lot of high spots when it comes to the ladder matches. This was a an era where these two were going to go in there and they were going to work a very methodical pace, a very uh, story-based match, and they did the most with what they were given, and it turned out to be an excellent match, the match of the night for me. The only thing that I hated, like I said, Mark Henry is a fucking idiot. Crowd came unglued for Triple H winning the match, too. It's also really weird that I, I, another thing I didn't like about the finish, too, is essentially the babyface cheated the win. But we're in that era where there's a gray area with everybody, you know? Well, that's because people loved the uh, the personas and the characters of uh, D-Generation X. That was pretty much their gimmick. They're degenerates. They will do whatever they can and take cheap shots to get ahead. The Rock, obviously, he was the heel going into this match, so people hated him. So it was kind of a case where... Turnabout's fair play. Right. And, and with The Rock, too, like I said earlier, you could also hear, especially, like, the male fans, especially in this crowd, Rock was over as fuck in this match. The people's elbow in the ladder, um, just fans were behind him, too. Yeah, both just, these guys were over. Yeah. Both these guys were over. This, this, was, this was the type of match where you take two guys who are insanely over in the roles that they are given. Um... They'll, they'll both get cheers regardless because of how great they are and then at the end of the day you'll get a great fucking match that yeah. that's that's one of the that's one of the the key ingredients to getting a great overall match obviously you can get a great wrestling match and more and people will will care as time as the match goes on because they're two excellent workers but when you got two people who connect with the crowd and play their roles beautifully like triple h and the rock did at that time it is going to enhance the match tenfold, and that's exactly what happened here. 100%. The shame, the shame about this match is that Triple H was actually injured during this match. He was working injured. He would win the title here at the height of his popularity. He would have to vacate the title, actually, a few weeks later, and he wouldn't return until, like, December of 98, which kind of, you know, took some of the steam off his popularity, but it, he was right back in there by December, just as popular and then, you know, obviously they turned him heel by Mania next year, and then off to the races we went with Triple H. Obviously, we know where The Rock's career went. I think The Rock did okay for himself. I'm just kidding. Um, I mean, the guy, the guy, the guy has, uh, he's accumulated a career, both in and out of wrestling, that a lot of people would fucking kill for. Exactly. Main event time, the reason we're all here, the reason, the theme of this entire pay-per-view was built around... The entire summer was built around this match right here. We've seen them as tag champs. Or can they coexist? And yeah, they've played that storyline out by now. My God, every time there's two baby faces going for a title, got to make them a tag team. But this was, they weren't doing that back then. This was another first they did that. You know, Austin and Taker beat Mankind, Triple H held the belts. They couldn't coexist. Leading up to this match, baby face versus baby face. Austin, I've seen it in a ton of his interviews. He, They both boycotted that... Yes, it needs to be a babyface versus babyface match. They were best friends in real life. They wanted this match. Bruce Pritchard, Vince McMahon, Vince Russo, all those guys just said, no, it should be a heel versus a babyface. The crowd would react better. The fans wouldn't have to choose. Obviously, they listen to Austin and Taker. You know, you get some pull when you're in that position. Creative control. They went babyface, babyface. The crowd was into this match, but I feel like if they had already turned, because they turned Taker a heel a month after this. If Taker was already like that satanic heel, I think we got a lot better crowd reactions because the fans love both of these guys, you know? Well, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, when it comes to a babyface versus babyface, that actually works out a lot better because then it really makes give, gives the fans a choice and it really gives you... It, it, it gives them a reason to watch the match rather than just a heel versus heel. A heel versus heel, heel versus heel match, that's, that's a lot harder to work with because 
then you're going to have to watch the match and see well, who, who's playing who in this match is uh, because, because of what happened with Sanity and the Authors of Pain, that was probably one of the best heel versus heel matches that I think I've ever seen as a wrestling fan. For me, the best There's heel versus match. heel match is still the Wyatt's versus the Shield matches. Those were insane. I don't even really think, good. I don't even think, I don't even think that was a heel versus heel match because at that time, the Shield were kind of turning babyface at that moment. The Shield were actually kind of babyfaces after the Royal Rumble. And they they kind of they, they kind of they kind of developed into a like vigilante baby faces after a while. The Wyatts were full blown heels, yeah. but I think people just gravitated more towards the Shield because of you know they, they they started to gravitate more away from the Authority. They actually faced Kane and the New Age Outlaws, squashed them at WrestleMania 30. Actually, yeah, and they, they didn't have a choice but to turn the Shield face too. Because let's be honest, during 2013. The Shield carried WWE, basically, as far as the best moments of the shows for the, the whole year. It was the Shield, the MVPs of that company. Oh, no, absolutely. And then the Wyatt family came around, and, you know, Bray Wyatt, another thing I'm going to talk about on my show, Bray Wyatt, man, he was on the run of his life for, like, the first eight months of his main roster career. He was beating Kane, beating Kofi, beating Brian, beat the Shield. He was beating everybody, and then then, then they had him lose to Cena. You and I were, were messaging earlier. I've always thought this match wasn't anything to write home about, but I, I like it. I don't hate the match. I just feel like it could have been so much more. But the reason is, is because two or three minutes into this match, the Undertaker whipped Steve, Irish whipped Steve Austin across the ropes. Undertaker ducked his head like he was going for a back body drop. Austin kicked him in that spot. And when he did, Undertaker was supposed to whip right up and like no sell the kick, right? But when he did, he unintentionally, his head knocked jaw, Austin in his jaw. It's right on camera. You can see it. Knocked Steve Austin out. Steve Austin has no memory of the rest of this match to this day. And it's amazing when that happens. Like moments like that in rest. Like when Daniel Bryan, you know, when he was in the Wyatt family, that cage match. And, you know, then he revealed that he turned on Bray Wyatt. The fans went crazy. Bray or Daniel Bryan has no memory of that because he got a concussion in this match. Same thing here. It speaks to the professionalism of these guys. <laughs> And how just goddamn talented they are, you know that they they just can 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 finish a match. Oh, no, absolutely. When it comes to uh, when it comes to uh, Undertaker and Shaw, uh, Undertaker and uh, Stone Cold Steve Austin, two of the most professional guys in the um in the history of the WWE or WWF, whatever you want to call it. But again, this really wasn't a this wasn't a match of the year candidate, but. I don't. I don't really understand the the negativity towards this match. This wasn't a. This wasn't anything to uh, to um, go back and rewatch. But it was a very good match for what it was. It was the second best match of the night for me. And both of these guys worked very very well. They did what they could, and there were some very good spots in this match. They told a very nice story, and Stone Cold Steve Austin ended up retaining uh, like he should have. And the Undertaker, Undertaker doing what Undertaker usually does, love that leg drop. Off the top through the announce table, and I thought it was—I thought it was even better that the table didn't break, made it look more intense. And the way that that was shot too was really well done. What a what a shot that is, you know? Oh no, absolutely. The, the camera work, my God, I don't know, I don't know, uh, I don't know how Kevin Dunn has gotten worse with the uh, camera cuts the, the best, as the years have gone. The on. best part about that leg drop, one cut, one fucking cut. That's all the camera cuts there were, you know. Less is more. And then, and then, yeah, we we got a Cesaro swing, and we need like seventeen cuts throughout the Cesaro swing. Like, what are you doing? <laughs> I think the main reason a lot of people don't like this match is a case of where the talent has kind of talked fans into not liking it. Because Steve Austin, until the end of time, is always going to say he hates this match. He's always said that he that's one of his least favorite matches. He was disappointed in himself. So I think fans of Steve Austin, especially listening to his podcast, kind of you know it's you know taking it from the top. Well, if he doesn't like it, how could I like it? I think Austin's way too hard on himself for this match. I've well, yeah, yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say. Like, I, I it's normal human nature for a, a human being in general to be hard on themselves. I don't know what it is, but that's pretty much that's pretty much what it is at the end of the day. We are our own worst critics because I've watched back some of my videos, and there are things that I've noticed, and there are things that I've done that I, I always say, like, oh my god, I wish I could have done that differently, yeah. or I hate that I stuttered. Like, I'm probably going to be listening to this back, and I'm going to be like, oh my god, I wish I didn't stutter, I wish I said something different there. It's just natural human nature. We're, we're hard on ourselves, so yeah. it, it is what it is. You can't really do too much about it, but overall, this was, again, not a match of the year candidate, but for SummerSlam, 
this this was one of the only matches on the card that was worthy of the title SummerSlam. If it wasn't, I would be the first to tell you this main event sucked. It suck. It wasn't wasn't a great wrestle like like a, a match of the year candidate type. Oh my god, you gotta go back and watch this. No. But it was a very good match. Yeah. And and I feel like it's finally time that I gave you something decent to watch for one of these reviews, you know? So you're welcome. Holy shit, please. WrestleMania three is not that bad. It just hasn't aged the best, I feel like. No, that was a two match show. Yeah. It was a terrible show outside of Savage and Savage and uh Steamboat and then the main event with Hogan and Andre. Hogan and Andre wasn't even a bad match. It was just probably the most basic match. The spectacle. That yeah, yeah, it was it was the most basic match that anyone could have ever wrestled. Literally, you and me could have wrestled that exact same match <laughs> for twelve minutes if we memorized all the moves. It was literally punch, punch, back body drop, body slam, bear clothesline, hug. punch, 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 bear hug, big boot, slam, leg drop. Who would be Andre like, if we really... did that? Who would play Andre? Um, I don't know. How tall are you? <laughs> Overall, what do you grade SummerSlam 98? Probably a D plus or C minus. Again, two match, two match show. Outside of the last two matches, none, n no match on the show was worthy of SummerSlam. Maybe Val Venus and D'Lo Brown, if the ending would have been better, I would have probably given it a, a C. I'm just going to give it like a C plus. I feel like it's it it, it it is the Attitude Era encapsulated in one show. This was the Attitude Era. A lot more bad than good on the card, but the matches that mattered delivered. Exactly. Like now, nowadays, you can't get away with that. You need to put on an overall good show. It's not just going to be one or two matches. Yeah. Nowadays, I feel like it's flipped. I feel like the matches that do matter now don't deliver, and like the the undercard matches are the ones that are like break out. Oh, that was the best match on the card. You know. Well, it 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 would it would really depend on it depends on multiple things when you think about it. it if, unless story. it's Roman Reigns in the main event, because Roman has just been putting out bangers. You know. Oh yeah, oh, yeah. Well, Roman's untouchable right now. Every single time Roman Reigns puts on a match, it's a match of the year candidate. Uh, Jey Uso, Kevin Owens, Daniel Bryan, Edge, Cesaro, every everybody. I mean that that's that that's not by design. That that just goes to show you how well Roman Reigns has taken to this character. I feel as though Roman's actually gotten better in the ring because his character's gotten better. I totally one hundred percent agree. Thank I don't you. know what it is. He, he's just taking it. Thank he's you, just taking man. to a look at Fish to Water. Thank you, man, for once again coming back, doing this. The next time I'll talk to you will be on your channel. But before we get there, once again, where can everyone find your channel and all that goodness? Uh, Twitter, History Maker DJS, Instagram, The DJ Storms, Facebook, Don Experia, Collaborations and Business Inquiries, Storms Takeover at gmail.com. Like official DJ Storms business page, and I'll send you an invite to join the official DJ Storms posse group on Facebook. That is, subscribe to me on YouTube, DJ Storms. LFU is going to be on Fridays for the next month. I will notify everyone when it goes back to Saturdays at 1 p.m. Eastern time, of course. Like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notifications bell with a huge coup de gras, and you will know whenever I pop up on YouTube. Because like I said at the beginning of the show, whenever I pop up on YouTube, it's the best time to be on YouTube. Uh, pleasure to be back, man. Can't wait to have you back on my channel for the rundown for SummerSlam. And uh, again, I'm very, very interested to uh, hear your take on uh, Nikki Trash as the uh, Raw Women's Champion. Oh, so specifically, here's 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 a question that's going to be rather interesting. Now that Ric Flair is gone, and Charlotte actually took her first clean loss on Monday Night Raw to Nikki Trash in about two three years. What do you think happens at SummerSlam? Do you think that they're going to give the title back to Charlotte or not because of what's going on with her father? Uh, hopefully they put it back on Ripley because she's become an afterthought and they fix that before they completely ruin it. That's what I'm hoping they do because there's no reason. Ripley... It's not going to happen. Well, I, guarantee, can, I can dream. I guarantee you right now, <laughs> guarantee you right now, Nikki Trash is probably going to retain because of a uh, pin towards Rhea Ripley. And if we do get Charlotte and Nikki Trash... I have a feeling Charlotte's going to get that title right back. But you know what? You know what I'm actually hoping for? Shayna is report supposedly done with Nia after what happened on Raw. Put it on Shayna. Put it on Shayna. We will see. I, it just it, if any if Raw was any indication, it, it, Rhea Ripley got no reaction for her entrance. People don't care already Be, because she has no fucking identity. It's hard to relate and get behind someone when they don't even know what their character is. I. I 
dude, I, I, I've, I've lost, I've lost all my sanity by watching that show. I don't even know how I do it. Like the only, again, the only reason why I do it is because I got, a, I got a nice, hefty group of people that are gonna take time out of their days when they could be either going to the bar, going to the movies, hanging with friends, hanging with family. They take time out of their day to watch me yell and scream into a camera for two and a half hours about pro wrestling. WWE's Glad lost all their sanity too, by the way, especially since they're all either fired or in awful gimmicks. Dude, how do you how do you fucking fire Bray Wyatt? How? Uh, we can talk about this all day, but we'll save it for the rundown SummerSlam when I'm on your channel. Until then, hit that red button, subscribe down below. Other goodness, retro gaming, pro wrestling, heavy metal podcast, and your official Hibiki TV merch. Union smacked up bigcartel.com. Get a t-shirt, get a mug, get anything you want over there. Hit it up today. Until next time, Hibiki High Spots. <laughs>